where have they gone? A hill of sighs, a house that cries, doors no longer locked, crimson stains, glorious trains. In July of 1862 in Eastern America, the war between the states was raging. Out west in the expansive and loosely organized Idaho Territory, John White and William Eads prospected the lush banks of a brook that wound gracefully through desert foothills. To their astonishment, they discovered easily accessible deposits of placer gold, mined with such simple tools as gold pans and rocker boxes. They named the stream Grasshopper Creek after the original pesty colonizers. Remarkably, their nuggets assayed at 99.5%, pure gold without need of refinement. By the fall of 1862, 400 miners had rushed to the grasshopper diggings, which swelled to 4,000 within a year. Within that same period, some 28,000 ounces of gold was panned, worth over $60 million at today's value. Soon, a decidedly prosperous town was built 300 yards north of the creek and was named Bannock, a misspelling of a local indigenous tribe. One of the first prominent men to call Bannock home was Sidney Edgerton, a lawyer, an abolitionist, a colonel in the Ohio militia who served as a sharpshooter with the famous squirrel hunters, marksmen who defended Cincinnati against Confederates two months after the discovery of gold along Grasshopper Creek. Early in the spring of 1863, President Lincoln appointed Edgerton as the Chief Justice of the Idaho Territorial Supreme Court, although the capital of the territory was yet to be decided. Hence, the Chief Justice, with his family, including a nephew and niece, immediately made the arduous journey to Bannock. There, together with other community leaders, Edgerton petitioned the President and Congress to separate a vast tract of land from the Idaho Territory. Their efforts were successful and Montana was born, Bannock its first capital, and Edgerton its first territorial governor. Edgerton's niece, a resourceful and highly educated woman, established another first for Montana, operating the first public school in Bannock, in her uncle's home, with 12 students attending the fall session. Her name could be scripted right out of a cliched Hollywood western, Miss Darling. Lucia was not impressed by the rich burgeoning city, saying, Bannock was tumultuous and rough, the headquarters of a band of highwaymen, and lawlessness and misrule seemed to be the prevailing spirit of the place. But into this little town had drifted many worthy people who unbendingly held firmly to their principles of right. There were few families there, and the parents were anxious to have their children in school. Also in 1863, Cordelia Ann Kirkpatrick, a beautiful, slender, 11-year-old girl, made the perilous seven-month journey from Wisconsin to Bannock. By ox wagon, her family traversed the Mormon and Bozeman trails, led by none other than the famous John Bozeman. At one point, they were accosted by Indians, who attempted to purchase Cordelia. When the offer was refused, hostilities ensued and the wagon train was forced to retreat. Nonetheless, they arrived in Bannock City on October 16, 1863. Cordelia was the daughter of James Kirkpatrick, a sugar plantation engineer, and the refined and lovely Mary Abigail Martin. Earlier in 1863, a ruggedly handsome young pioneer, Henry Pond, began working the diggings at Grasshopper Creek. But Henry possessed carpentry skills that were in great demand in the mushrooming town. Hence, he soon left the fickle occupation of prospecting, for Bannock's placer gold was beginning to pan out, and commenced building homes and business buildings. Later, he was appointed deputy postmaster of the city. Three years passed, and Cordelia Kirkpatrick blossomed into womanhood. At age 14, she was considered of age to marry, and on January 21, 1866, she became Mrs. Henry Pond. Theirs was a happy marriage, and over the next few years, Cordelia bore three children, Mary, Maurice, and Marcia. With their quickly gained wealth, miners were not content to live in bedrolls and tents. Among the 60 buildings still standing are a line of houses called Bachelor's Row, paralleling Main Street, that served as their quarters. Mary Edgerton, the wife of the governor, wrote of these men. 
The miners here are all waiting anxiously for warm weather to come so that they can wash the dirt they have got out during the winter. Some have already washed the dirt. From the claim that Mr. Edgerton shook last fall, the men washed $1,500 in one day, $1,000 another day, and $600 still another day. But that is all the good the money will do them, for as soon as they get any, they gamble and drink it up. Another 1863 immigrant to Bannock was Cyrus Skinner, a convict formerly of San Quentin Penitentiary. However, Cyrus was not willing to labor on the grasshopper for his gold, but had other plans, easier plans to get rich. His type were always the predators of mining towns. A contemporary of Skinner, Nathaniel Langford, held this brand of man in disdain. Langford said, The number of drinking and gambling saloons was greatly in excess of stores and private dwellings, and to nearly all of these was attached that most important attraction of a mining town, the hurdy-gurdy. The sound of a violin which struck the ear on entering the street was never lost while passing through it and at many of the saloons the evidence of the orgies which were in progress inside was often apparent in the eagerness exhibited by the crowd which surrounded the building without. The voices of the auctioneers on the street corners, the shouts of frequent horsemen as they rode up and down the streets, the rattle of vehicles arriving and departing for the miners' camps, troops of miners, Indians, gamblers, the unmeaning babble of numerous drunken men, the tawdrily apparelled dancing women of the hurdy-gurdies, all together present a scene of life in an entirely new aspect to the person who for the first time entered a mining town, which cannot elsewhere be found, search the whole world over. The thirst for gold is shared by all classes. Those who are unwilling to labor in their efforts to obtain it by less honorable means flock to the mines to ply their guilty vocations. Hence, there is no vice unrepresented in a mining town. Skinner spared no expense building his saloon in Bannock in the very shadow of the territorial legislature. Eventually, these structures were torn down to build the brick courthouse that was later converted into the Hotel Mead. Bannock State Park Ranger John Phillip reported to NBC that the saloon's most impressive amenity is a 21-foot bar, probably mahogany something we don't have in Montana. I think it goes to show you what the priorities are in a town that's 90% male. Saloons are the center of social life. Again, Langford wrote, A civil war was raging at the time. Sympathizers with each party fled to the mines to escape the possible responsibilities they might incur by remaining in the states. They carried their political views with them, loyalty and succession each flourished by turn, and were the prolific causes of frequent bloody dissensions. There was no law to restrain human passion, so that each man was a law unto himself, according as he was swayed by the evil or good of his own nature. Posters on the wall of Skinner's saloon read, Nice people do not wander into Skinner's. This was where the most dangerous, meanest, and ruthless men in the territory congregated. It was not safe to walk down the streets of Bannock after dark and even sometimes in the daylight. Shooting and killing was normal here. The demise of road agent George Carhart happened in this very building. One evening when gambler George Banfield and miner Dick Sapp were playing poker, Banfield's love of winning got the best of him and he was discovered cheating. Both men emptied pistols at each other inside this saloon missing every shot. At first, the only effect of their impromptu fray seemed the shooting of Tootles, a small dog. While lamenting the loss of the community dog, it was discovered that George Carhart was shot in the stomach. He died a short time later in extreme agony. As this account tells of the death of road agent George Carhart, you might wonder just what a road agent is. Simply said, they were the most heinous robbers and murderers of the Wild West. Skinner's bar was infested with these men, who were known only to each other. As their shared crimes were committed covertly in a perverse brotherhood, road agents believed there were no witnesses of their evil deeds. Mingling with the miners, they learned who struck it rich, where they kept their gold, and what their travel plans might be, especially when liquor loosened lips. 
a weary miner, would never bring all his wealth with him to the saloon, and therefore plans were made in Skinner's to trap him, rob him, and perhaps kill him. To the more foolish miner, money and life were sometimes taken on the spot, as evidenced by crimson stains in the wooden floor. The posters continue. So much shooting and violence occurred in this saloon that the barber in the corner wouldn't miss a stroke with a straight edge razor when the bullet started flying. Nonetheless, as schoolmistress Darling had written, there were many people who unbendingly held firmly to their principles of right in Bannock. The first frame house constructed in Bannock was built by an astute miner by the name of William Rowe. Quote, he arrived in Bannock in 1862, and even though he filed one of the first claims here, his interest turned to the more profitable businesses of freighting, merchandising, and banking. He and his brother Isaac opened a general store and meat market, and soon after that licensed a banking business to buy gold. He later moved to Dillon and was one of the founders of the state bank in 1899, end quote. Considering the extreme lawlessness of Bannock in the Montana Territory, how was it possible for men like William Rowe to operate freight businesses, mercantile stores, and banks? This is no idle question as road agents killed more than 100 men in 1863 alone. The answer may offend people today who live in a modern society protected by a sedulous police force. The truth is that William Rowe belonged to a committee whose most august member was none other than Governor Sidney Egerton. All committee members had signed an oath to prosecute thieves and killers and uphold common law. They were, in fact, vigilantes. Bannock had a sound jail and a gallows to execute justice built by Henry Plummer, quote, a man of gentlemanly bearing and dignified deportment, end quote. Bannock's newly elected sheriff, why didn't Henry Plummer take action against the road agents? Was it that he had but few deputies and could not go against a criminal conspiracy comprised of scores of murderers? Why were the law-abiding people of Bannock forced to turn to vigilantes? A year before the gold strike on the grasshopper, a notorious gambler, this same Henry Plummer, had beguiled and abandoned a beautiful young lady in Lewiston, stealing her away from an honest, heartbroken husband and leaving her destitute as one of the lowest inmates of a frontier brothel. Like Skinner, Plummer had also served time in San Quentin, convicted of killing a man, a deed which became an addiction for Plummer. According to Langford, the despoiling of the Lewiston woman, quote, was soon forgotten. He, meanwhile, in the pursuit of his profession as a gambler, formed the acquaintance of many congenial spirits. From their subsequent operations, it was also apparent that at his instigation, an alliance was formed with them, which had for its object the attainment of fortune by the most desperate means. Every man of wealth in any of the mining camps was marked as the prey, sooner or later, of this abandoned combination. Every gambler or rough was induced to unite in the criminal enterprise, and thus originated the band of desperados which spread terror through the northern mines. Plummer was their acknowledged leader." End quote. When Plummer showed up in Bannock, the miners were taken in by his sophistication and authoritative manner, and seeing no need of looking into his background, elected him sheriff. Skinner was his partner in the secret society, ironically called the Innocents. The committee was not so easily fooled. Another of the honest citizens opposing the criminal element of Bannock was a French-Canadian by the name of Javier Renoir. Like Henry Pond, Renoir was a carpenter who later became a member of the school board and the Masonic Lodge. Whether he was a committee member or not is unknown. Javier built his own cabin on the east end of Bannock. Using dovetail log notching and wooden peg construction, his home still stands in excellent condition, a lasting monument to his craft and workmanship. In her 1983 narrative of Montana's Gold Rush, Historian Dorothy Johnson tells of the rise of the vigilantes and the downfall of the road agents. One of her sources was a biography of Nathaniel Langford, previously quoted in our story. Just before he left on a trek to deliver 14,000 in gold dust to creditors in St. Louis, Henry Tilden, a close friend of the Egertons, rode into Bannock in great duress, having been robbed by three men. One of them, he thought, was Sheriff Plummer. 
Later, Langford confirmed Plummer's guilt when he discovered four men looking over his camp after nightfall. He was heavily armed, carrying a double-barreled shotgun loaded with 24 revolver balls. Knowing they were seen by Langford, the bandits rode off, but not before he identified Plummer. However, his word was insufficient to charge the sheriff. Not long after this, freighters with three wagons and a string of pack animals left Bannock for Salt Lake City, carrying 80,000 in gold and 1,500 in treasury notes. Among the group was John M. Bozeman. Forewarned of the road agents, they rode alert and armed with ample firepower to fight off the thieves. Two road agents, Dutch John Wagner and Steve Marshland, trailed the freighters and packers. After several days and at a place where the narrow trail forced the pack animals and freight wagons to separate a considerable distance with the packers to the fore, the two bandits attacked the rearmost wagon. One guard was concealed beneath the wagon cover and shot Marshland in the chest while the owner of the wagon, Milton Moody, wounded Dutch John in the shoulder. Subsequently, both these were caught and hanged by the vigilantes. After the killing of young Nick Tybalt, a seller of livestock, 25 enraged men from Nevada City found three road agents in a nearby wickiup, along with one of Tybalt's missing mules. The accused murderers were taken to the mining camp of Alder Gulch and found guilty by a miner's court with an audience of 1,500 miners. One of the bandits testified against his fellows, resulting in a guilty verdict, and one man, George Ives, was hanged from a makeshift scaffold while the others were expelled from Montana. Nonetheless, one hanging, considering the outrageous crimes in the territory, was not enough to bring this horrific evil to an end. Hence, the Committee of Vigilance signed this pact. Quote, We the undersigned, uniting ourselves in a party for the laudable purpose of arresting thieves and murderers, and recovering stolen property, do pledge ourselves upon our sacred honor each to all others, and solemnly swear that we will reveal no secrets, violate no laws of right, and never desert each other or our standard of justice. So help us God, as witnessed our hand and seal this 23rd of December, A.D. 1863." Thus began the intense pursuit of bad men by the committee. Dear Lodge vigilantes, in a futile attempt to track down the killers of one Deputy Sheriff Dillingham, discovered why their efforts had been frustrated. A message had been delivered to the murderers by a man named Red Yeager, warning them of pursuit. The vigilantes caught Yeager in Stinking Water Valley, and to their surprise, he told them freely more than they ever suspected. Yeager revealed that the road agents were a highly organized criminal conspiracy who called themselves the Innocents, for their password was, I am innocent. He gave many names of those who belonged to the secret combination and said absolutely that, quote, their chief was a smooth-talking, fast-shooting Sheriff Henry Plummer, end quote. Yet Yeager knew he would hang and must have felt some type of personal relief from the terrible guilt he felt. For, quote, this strange fellow shook our hands all around and told his captors, goodbye, boys, and God bless you. You're on a good undertaking whereupon the vigilante strung him up to a cottonwood bough." End quote. More arrests and hangings followed. Then on January 10, 1864, the vigilantes of Bangkok, having received the sure intelligence obtained from Red Yeager, moved swiftly to capture their deadliest enemy. They surprised Plummer, quote, at his cabin, in the act of washing his face, when informed that he was wanted, he manifested great unconcern and proceeded quietly to wipe his face and hands. I'll be with you in a moment, ready to go wherever you wish, he said to the leader of the vigilantes. Tossing down the towel and smoothing his shirt sleeves, he advanced towards a chair on which his coat was lying, carelessly remarking, I'll be ready as soon as I can put on my coat. One of the party, discovering the muzzle of his pistol protruding beneath his coat, stepped quickly forward, saying as he did so, I'll hand you your coat. At the same moment, he secured the pistol, which being observed by Plummer, the man turned deathly pale, thus defeating the desperate measures which a desperate man would have employed to save his life." End quote. The clean and elegantly dressed criminal, together with others of the innocents, were immediately conducted to the very gallows erected by Sheriff Plummer the previous season. Quote, Terrible must have been its appearance as it loomed up in the bright starlight. 
the only object visible to the gaze of the guilty man on that long waste of ghastly snow. His cohorts filled the air with curses. Plummer, on the contrary, first begged for his life, and finding that unavailing, resorted to argument and sought to persuade his captors of his innocence. It is useless, said one of the vigilantes. You are to be hanged. Do not answer me so, persisted the now humble and abject supplicant. But do with me anything else you please. I beg you to spare my life. I want to live for my wife, my poor, absent wife. I wish to see my sister-in-law. I want to settle my business affairs. Oh, God. Falling upon his knees, the tears streaming from his eyes, and with utterance choked with sobs, he continued, I am too wicked to die. I cannot go bloodstained and unforgiven into the presence of the Eternal. Plummer's time had come. The crisis of self-abasement had passed. Standing erect under the gallows, he took off his necktie and said, Now, man, as a last favor, let me beg that you will give me a good drop. Swiftly, the evil man's life was taken, and the terrible reign of the road agents came to an end. End quote. Criminality was not the only tragedy in Bannock. At times, scarlet, diphtheria, influenza, and typhoid fevers plagued the city. The Besset House, with its open, single upstairs room, was used to quarantine those who had contracted infectious sicknesses until they either, quote, recovered or died. Some people believe the house is haunted. Haunted by the children who died here during an outbreak of one of many contagious diseases. People have reported the sound of crying babies coming from the house, causing it to be known as the crying baby house, end quote. I heard no weeping as I ascended the old staircase of the sacred home, but it seemed to me as if the house still grieved for the babies who died here and for their mothers who would cradle their little ones no more. The panning of ultra-pure placer gold did not last long on Grasshopper Creek, yet there was still plenty of gold ore to be mined for many years. With the demise of placer deposits, miners in Bannock became employees working for large enterprises using hydraulic, load, and dredge mining operations. Gradually, however, Bannock's population decreased from its peak of 10,000 residents. Although the seat of government was taken from Bannock, it continued to be a productive city for many years. The imposing two-story Masonic Lodge with its square and compass emblem was built in 1874 at a cost of $1,500. The Masons met on the top floor, while charitably the first floor was built by the lodge to house Bannock's public school. Visitors today may climb the outside steps to the second floor and look into the old Masonic temple, where the ritual accoutrements of bygone days are on display. Interestingly, the Bannock Historic Lodge is number 3-7-77, and is still active with members from around the globe, contributing to the preservation of their building and town. This number, 3-7-77, is also on the patch worn by troopers of the Montana State Highway Patrol. What is the significance of this enigmatic symbol which dates back to the committee? The Association of Montana Troopers explains, quote, Chief Administrator Alex Stevenson personally designed the new insignia as a tribute to law and order. We chose the symbol, he explained later, to keep alive the memory of this first people's police force. This mysterious combination of numbers has captured the imagination of students of early Montana law enforcement ever since the old timers who knew its significance refused to reveal it. The original vigilantes took an oath of secrecy which was strictly observed through the death of the very last one of them. There are many explanations that have been explored over the years, and while their true meaning remains a mystery, one thing is clear. Those numbers struck fear into the hearts of those who found them tacked upon their doors. The most widely accepted theory today is that the numbers represent the dimensions of a grave, three feet wide, seven feet deep, and 77 inches long. The idea behind this is that if the road agent did not leave town within a given amount of time, 3 hours, 7 minutes, 77 seconds, they would find themselves in such a grave. 
Another theory explains that the numbers signify the vocation of persons involved in the organization. Three lawyers, seven merchants, and 77 miners. End quote. A year after the Masonic Lodge was constructed, the brick courthouse was built for $14,000. However, Bannock continued as the county seat only until 1881, when it was moved to Dillon. In 1891, the abandoned building was purchased by Dr. John Singleton Mead and renovated into the thriving Hotel Mead with its beautiful spiral staircase and spacious ceilings. What is the difference between Bannock and other old towns established in the 1800s? The Montana State Parks webpage states, Bannock is the best preserved of all Montana ghost towns. The key word, the key descriptor is ghost. An old town that has never been abandoned is seldom labeled this way. Is Bannock called a ghost town because it is now a lifeless ruin of what was once a living place, teeming with emotions and passions? Writing about the ghost towns of America, a U.S. consulate wrote, quote, A place is not called a ghost town for nothing. Even those who do not believe in the paranormal might feel a shiver down their spine while walking the empty streets with the wind howling through broken windows and half-closed doors. Dilapidated wooden houses stand in a row guarding both sides of the street, pretending their occupants have just gone out for errands and will return any time soon. Well, they will not, end quote. However, others claim they do return. A host of writers claim that Bannock is truly a ghost town. Each structure, quote, rife with spirits. Apparitions, young and old, have been seen wandering around town, going about their business as if the town was never abandoned at all. Doors of buildings swing open and slam shut without cause. Some state that Sheriff Plummer can be seen lingering close to Skinner's saloon, end quote. The Southwest Montana Tourist Association, with an obvious agenda, reports that Dorothy Dunn and her friends waded into a dredge pond in 1916, stepping unexpectedly into deep water. The friends were saved, but tragically, Dorothy was drowned. Later, a girlfriend of Dorothy's, whose parents managed the Mead Hotel, saw an apparition of Dorothy on the second floor of the hotel wearing her familiar long blue dress. This sighting of the ghost of Dorothy has been followed by many others. Whether these claims are true or false is, to my way of thinking, not the primary consideration. Then what is? Bannock is something akin to us. It had its own fleeting mortality, a birth, a life, a death, emblematic of each person whose home it was. For the most part, Bannock died during World War II when the federal government shut down private gold mines. Hence, the time of its temporal existence was not long, roughly 80 years quite comparable to the longest lifespan most of us can hope for. Countless cities have lived much longer. Venice has been continually inhabited for 1600 years, and according to UNESCO, Damascus was founded 3,000 years before Christ. Time is such a strange thing. When I was a boy, a summer seemed to last forever, as did a single day in school. As I grew older, the weeks began to fly by, then months, then seasons, and now years fly by at jet speed along the sands of time. Why? Bannock signifies the brevity of an incomplete century, while Damascus embodies millenniums, and somehow we relate to both. To Sheriff Plummer, in the height of his power, all he cared about was his temporal or temporary gratification, regardless of the cost to others. Perhaps during most of his 32 years of life he was atheistic or agnostic. Yet when he knew that he had but a few more breaths to breathe, he exclaimed, I am too wicked to die. I cannot go bloodstained and unforgiven into the presence of the Eternal. At that moment Henry was convinced that he was more than the outward form that immediately would perish. He knew that he, his spirit self, his ghost, was going unforgiven somewhere, somewhere he called the presence of the eternal. What does all this have to do with time? Many people believe that a child comes from God and most people, especially when they're about to die, hope that somehow they will return. An ancient prophet, Peter, spoke of earth's time versus heaven's time, saying that a thousand years here is equal to one day there. If this is taken literally, 
then there is a simple calculation of the two times. By dividing the 24 hours of a single day into 1,000 years, we find that each hour of heaven's time equates to 42 years of earth's time. Or in other words, if a person dies when they are 84 years old, their mortal life spans but two hours as viewed from on high. Is it then true that as we grow old and approach our return, we begin to measure the sands of time more quickly, more in accord with heaven's measurement? Then consider how truly brief life is for those who die young. The first cemetery of Bannock was established on a hill only a few hundred yards north of Main Street. From this hill I took the photographs of the ghost town that are a vital part of the story. A strong westerly wind blew past Plummer's Gallows and up the dry grassy slope to the graveyard where I stood. My eyes fell upon a prominent tombstone which reads, In memory of Cordelia A., wife of Henry S. Pond, born February 23, 1852, died September 27, 1875. Cordelia, the 11-year-old pioneer, the 14-year-old bride, mother of two daughters and a son, whom she buried in the first year of his life, died in her beauty when she was but 23 years of age of typhoid fever. She was laid next to the body of her son, Maurice. There are many things that are true that are not understood, or only partially so. As a former airline pilot, I know a great deal about the theory of flight, much more so than most of my passengers. Yet I never cease to be amazed at how such an incredibly heavy machine could so easily take to the air and cross such vast distances in so short a time. Holy Writ explains how all things were first created spiritually, then naturally or physically. Somehow there is intelligence in the heavens and the earth, in the sky, in the sea, in the trees and the soil, in the very elements. For all these are obedient to their Creator. All these are witnesses of that which is done in their midst, and if allowed, may give voice to that which they witness. In the ancient chronicles we read that at one time all of creation groaned. Additionally, that stones may cry out, and that spilled blood may also cry to God for justice. Seldom in this life do we hear and understand the whisperings of the preternatural, but sometimes, if we are very quiet and listen carefully, we may feel their voices. The road agents thought that no one saw their appalling acts when, in truth, everything beheld their deeds. Not one of the old inhabitants of Bannock are still alive, at least physically. Their ghosts have passed into another existence, as Plummer said, passed into the presence of the Eternal. Yet could they appear to someone or haunt their old possessions? Might they speak to us in familiar settings? I personally believe that those who were engaged in worthwhile endeavors during their mortal lives are somehow magnified in their abilities in the next world where there is much more to accomplish than we could ever imagine. As human as this may sound, I think they are too busy to amuse the curious with sightings. However, this may not be true of those who wasted away the days of their lives or who used their time upon the earth to prey upon the innocent. Nonetheless, places seem to retain the powerful sentiments of the dramas they witnessed. The settings of history are touchstones to the past. I stood upon the hill of the old cemetery of Bannock and looked at Cordelia's stone monument, feeling the warm wind upon my face. It seemed to me the hill was sighing, remembering the hearts that were broken when the young mother was laid to rest. Never do the never-aging hills forget that which they have seen. Now that I might understand, the hills seem to remember again that which happened upon its summit in 1875, and quietly moaned again its musings of that morning. Where has she gone? Oh, how her little girls sorrow! See how unceasingly tears wet their pure faces, how their lips and bodies tremble. Oh, the pain of this profound loss! See how quiet is their father! Does Henry even hear the kind minister as he speak words 
over the freshly broken earth? Ah, there is Cordelia now. How changed she is from that form laid in her coffin, pocked with blisters from her suffering. Ah, Cordelia, how beautiful, how graceful, how holy, how radiant. Ah, ah. I feel a melancholy breath of wind lamenting. If only, if only. But alas, their eyes are veiled and cannot see all that is. Nonetheless, Cordelia has come, not only to bring them solace, but to grieve with her beloved family. Who is the tall man who walks at her side, holding her hand? Have I seen him before? His face, do I see familiarity? Ah, yes, his eyes, the expression. It is Maurice, whose infant body I embrace, next to where they lay the clay of his mother. Ah, ah, how good, how manly he appears as his true self. Ah, ah, sighs the empathetic hill. Leaving the X-shaped log fence surrounding the cemetery, I walk over to the western slope of the hill and look down into the narrow valley. Although the day is hot, I had not felt the heat until that moment. The tough boughs of a lone cedar tree bend with a gust of wind, but it carries no sentiments to me from the barren path leading to the gallows upon which my eyes are contemptuously fixed. The thoughts that fill my mind are only my own, as I consider the man who was a greater plague upon Bannock than all the natural maladies that had taken so many lives. The valley is only a valley, void of utterance. I feel no muttered remembrances. No angry accusations, no cries for vengeance against road agents or their lawless chieftain. Justice has been served, and it seems the Dell will not even speak their names. Only later, when the image of the stain on the saloon floor returned to my mind, did I think of words spoken long ago. It must needs be that offense has come, but woe to that man by whom the offense cometh. Then I thought of the command that follows this ominous warning. If thine eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee. It is better for thee to enter into life with one eye rather than having two eyes to be cast into hellfire. If only the Faw Sheriff had plucked out his lustful eye before he shamefully degraded the woman from Lewiston. If only that wretched man had plucked out his avarice eye of mayhem before he organized his Gadianton robbers. Then would he not have declared that he was too wicked to die and would not now be in hell. Mary Edgerton, the wife of the former territorial governor and many of the women of Bannock, expressed concern about the lack of formal religion in their community and longed for a proper place to worship. Nonetheless, they had to make do, meeting in their homes or out in the open on clement days listening to circuit riders who were the traveling ministers of the frontier. I found this jewel of a story in the Bannock State Park brochure. Quote, One of the most famous to serve Bannock was William Wesley Van Ortsel, finally remembered as Brother Van. When he arrived in Montana in 1872, he was assigned a district that included Bannock and Virginia City, finding all the gambling houses and bars open on Sunday. Stepping up to one of the bars, he announced that he was a minister. The bartender whistled the crowd to quietness and informed them that the bar was closed for one hour. Brother Van had his chance and in his marvelous voice sang a popular song of the day, A Diamond in the Rough. The crowd, hungry for entertainment, asked for more. He continued and the crowd got a good hour's worth of religion." End quote. Then in August of 1877, the citizens of Bannock were stirred from complacency by news of a fearful and bloody battle fought between the Nez Perce Indians and the U.S. 4th Infantry at Big Hole. Reports stated that the Nez Perce were headed directly for Bannock. Soon the camps surrounding the city were emptied of miners, ranchers, and their families who sought refuge in town. Breastworks were hastily thrown up and the primary water supply was barricaded. Women and children flocked to the courthouse and plans were made to lock them in the safes if an attack did occur. Although the Nez Perce did slay men on a prairie southwest of Bannock, they thankfully did not raid the city. 
After it was apparent the town was safe from attack, Brother Van, being the promoter that he was, took advantage of the large number of people in town and talked them into completing the first and only church in Vanek. Despite Brother Van's persuasive rhetoric, it seems only natural that many of those present during this dreadful scare were humbled into the realization that there were forces in the world beyond their control, and only with heaven's intervention could they hope for greater safety. When I have interviewed veterans of wars, they have expressed this same belief. Although the chairs and the chapel were certainly not the original benches used here, the setting was sufficient for me to imagine the faithful, rugged pioneers who, within these walls, lifted their voices in glorious strains to heaven above. Not all that glitters radiant is gold.